Okay, yesterday we talked about uh, access from Egypt, we talked about the freedom, the value of freedom, um, and it was suggested that I should come back to what happened in Egypt to explain what the conditions were and what we were freed from and what the significance of it is. I think that's a good idea. I'll try to do it briefly. Um, we spent 210 years in Egypt. Uh, the first period was glorious. Joseph was the viceroy of the king, and we were the nobility. <coughs> and Pharaoh said, you can have the best part of the land, and uh, they were treated like royalty. Out of the 210 years, approximately 90 were spent in slavery. The rest of the majority was spent in very high station. Now, the tradition preserves the cause of the, of the deterioration until all of the original tribes died, that is to say the children of Jacob died. The Jews lived in a specific area. They had their own ghetto. No, the medieval Italians did not invent the ghetto, although it's their word. <clears throat> it goes back to Joseph self-consciously choosing an isolated area for the Jews to live. And they practiced circumcision the whole time. Then, after the original sons of Jacob all died, that started to deteriorate. They stopped practicing circumcision, and they spread out geographically, so that by the time of the Exodus, you could speak of each Jewish woman should go to her non-Jewish neighbor and take things out of the house, because they all had non-Jewish neighbors. Now, the Nitziv has an essay on exile and success in exile, survival in exile. He quotes various verses. The bottom line is, if you isolate yourselves and make yourself strange, different, unacceptable, then people, the, the non-Jews among whom you live, will love you. If you cut yourself off, they'll love you. And it is only creeping assimilation, creeping similarity, that causes them to hate. And he quotes a verse, uh, that by Afoch Libam the Snow Asamo, Khajbrohu overturned the hearts of the Egyptians to hate his to, uh, to hate his people. Meaning their hearts were not inclined to hate them. Not at all. They accepted them and respected them and loved them. Loved them, he says. Until the, the barriers broke down. When the barriers broke down, that's when the when the change occurred. Again, we're not talking psychology, sociology, economics, and all the rest of that. Ology stuff. He says, God turned their hearts over to hate them. We're talking about divine providence now. And that began the period of, of uh, physical slavery, which means that the loss of Jewish separate identity was first, and physical slavery was second, which means that the essential exile in Egypt was an exile of Jewish identity. The subjugation of the body was a secondary effect. I heard this idea from a bullman, who was the mashkiach here in Orzameh when I first came. The freedom from Egypt, the liberation from Egypt, was essentially a liberation of the Jewish identity. And it took time. That's why after the exodus took place, the angels complained to God, why are you saving this group of people and destroying that group of people? They both worship idols. Now, my brother pointed this out to me some time ago. Um, you have to be careful here. Before they left Egypt, in the days of darkness, 80% of the people died. Those were presumably the people who couldn't make an adjustment to the new reality. And then, just before, the day before they left, 
they did circumcision, and they offered the Paschal sacrifice, which was a totem item for the Egyptians, and in their face they had to, had to sacrifice it, an act of great courage, great dedication to the Kodesh Baruch Hu, offering a sacrifice to the Kodesh Baruch Hu in, all, in, 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 in and of itself. How could you call them idol worshippers? Six days later, when they were standing by the sea, and the sea drowned the Egyptians and saved the Jews, the angels were complaining. They both worship idols. So, as she put it, it's not that they were both actively engaged in idol worship behavior, but the stamp of the idol worship experience was still on them. They hadn't reformed themselves completely from it. It took 49 days. 49 days to climb out of the 49 gates of defilement and to achieve the 49 gates of holiness. So that's the essential um, exile in Egypt. It was a spiritual exile. And this is the answer to the often asked question, why are we celebrating freedom from Egypt when in later generations we were subjugated? How could it be that during the Holocaust there were people who threat, wished their lives to be able to celebrate the Seder in any way that they could when they were slaves and worse than slaves? And the answer is, as I saw in the Svarsemis, but it's, it's, it's written in many Svarim, that the liberation that took place from Egypt is irreversible. It's irreversible. Because essentially it was a spiritual liberation. No foreign power can cause Jews to lose their Jewish identity. We can throw it away. We can do that. But no foreign power has the power to do that. That liberation from Egypt was a permanent transformation in the Jewish people. And that's why it has existed until this day, though individual Jews were lost, but the continuity of, of the Jewish people was not lost. So, Rabbi Gulman had a bunch of explanations of the Haggadah that are, that are based on this, but I'm not, I'm not going to go into this, but I think that's crucial to understand that it was a spiritual exile and a spiritual liberation. Okay, now back to part four, chapter four, which we're going to finish now, and then we'll go on to prayer. This is still about Torah. I am skipping some of the material, but I, I want to get on. Um, so we're up to paragraphs 11 and 12, which are the end of the chapter. He's talking about the blessings that we make before, before we say the Shema. Um, now he says something here, I may have mentioned this to you in the past, but, but here's where it gets its application. We are told that God renews the work of creation continuously. Mechadesh tomid my sabrashas. He renews the work of creation continuously. But it also says, Bechol Yom, every day. Now, even a six-year-old can understand that if it's every instant an instant, of course it's every day. Every day is filled with new instants. It's happening all the time. What does the sitter mean by telling us that it is continuous and every day? <clears throat> I don't know anybody else who asked this question. I told you that Ramchal is a philosopher. This is the kind of question a philosopher would ask. So he says, what is renewed continuously is the existence of the creation. But in addition to that, the Shefa, the divine energy, which is proportioned to the, to the um, which is created, I should say, because it's such a created thing, created for the sustenance of the, of the, um, of, of the, of the creation, is new, and it has not only the power to maintain, renew creation, but it has the power to stamp the creation with a certain character, with a certain theme, with a certain concept, with a certain, certain, sh certain, shub a certain shub subject. And every day is different. Every day is different. 
if I would give you an analogy, it would be like going, let's say you're, go, you're in university and you're going from course to course, year to year. Hopefully, if you're a reasonably good student, you don't repeat any courses. So you take Algebra 1, and then Algebra 2, and then Algebra 3, and then Algebra 4. Each one is based on the previous material you learned in algebra, but it's new. The world is in a constant state of development. There are no repeats. Every day introduces a somewhat different theme for the day. So when you talk about the actual root existence of the world, that's a process that's continuous. But the themes change on a daily basis. The Arizal, among the many, many, many things that he did, he had mystical in interpretations and, and um, thoughts that he used in the, con in the context of prayer. And someone somehow got, got hold of some of what he was doing and noticed that every day there were different intentions. So they asked him, why is it different every day? Now, I don't, I don't know the exact words that he used, but in our terminology it would be, well, yesterday was N days from the creation, and today is N plus one days from the creation. How could you repeat? It's not the same day. You're a different spot on the developmental curve. So if you're a different spot, it requires a different attention. What is it? Say again? By different theme every day, mean a different goal, a different thing needs to be accomplished. Next? Okay, there's a different theme, and now we have to react to that theme. We have to interact with that theme. Part of what you do when you say Shema is you are, as we said, you're, you're, you're expressing the concept that everything's under the control of a particular agent, right? One particular agent. And then we said <coughs> that it's not just unity, because there could be one particular agent who says it's the creator. For it, for it to be labeled as the agency of the creator, it has to express loving kindness because that's the purpose of the creation. Now, take those two ideas and just uh, apply them in more detail. Okay, so it's coming from the creator. And the creator is, is managing a process of loving kindness. What step is today's step? Well, what's required today for the, to, uh, for, for the loving kindness to show? The last year or year and a half I've been suffering from tendonitis. I finally got to a, to a physical therapist, and he's giving me exercises. So the next step in God's kindness to me is providing me with someone who can direct me to do exercises, which will reduce the pain that I have in tendonitis. I wasn't doing those exercises six months ago. Maybe I should have been. That's today's theme in the kindness that God is giving to me. That kind of shift applies to the world as a whole. Now, when you say the Shema, you are identifying God as the agency that's running the world, which has to include also today's theme. Now, if you don't happen to know today's theme, I don't know them either, and the Arizal, but you can say to a Baruch I know there's a new theme, and I intend my recognition of your unity and your all-encompassing control to include today's theme also. And with this understanding, Ramchal makes an astonishing remark. To me, it was astonishing anyway. He says, we have three prayers a day. They are not of equal length. The morning prayer is by far the longest prayer. The evening prayer is second as long. And the afternoon prayer is quite short. Why is that? So first of all, from the question, you realize there's a reason why it is. Nothing's just a throwaway. Nothing's an accident. These things are planned. Now, when we say each day gets a new theme, I have a rule. If you ask a question, get a simple answer, it's wrong. You know, when does the day start? Well, which day? Not all days are the same. In particular, there's the day of creation, which we know starts in the evening. It goes from evening to evening. The days of the week go from evening to evening. But then there's the day of the sacrifices. The day of sacrifice starts in the morning, not in the evening. If you bring a sacrifice, either you, you eat it, if, you, if it's a kind of sacrifice you can eat, so you eat it for that day and that night end, 
or for that day, that night, and the next day until nighttime. But that's it. So the, the day is like from, from morning to morning. So that's when the new theme comes in. The new theme comes in in the morning. So the morning prayer registers that there's a new theme that needs to be integrated into the world in a certain way. And it's just not just the Shema, but it's the blessings of the Shema and the associated things that you say. All of this is, a, among other things, a project of integrating uh, that theme into the day. Now, in the 24-hour period of a day, there's daylight and darkness. Daylight and darkness are a variation on the theme, a substantial variation on the theme. That's why when you come to evening, you need a fairly long prayer to integrate that same theme from the morning, but integrate it into the darkness part of the day. When you come to Mincha, you already integrated the theme into the 24-hour period in general by doing saying Shachris. And into the daytime period also by saying Shachris. And you're still in the daytime. Okay, there's a very minor variation from morning till afternoon. Mincha is dedicated to that very minor variation, and that's why it's short. Don't tell me, well, Mincha is in, in, inconvenient because it's the middle of the workday, so you know, how much time can you give? You know, forget that. That's, the rule that you have to learn is that what we do here is because of what's going on there. That's really why we do what we do. Uh, I learned this rule in 1991 when my parents both died. They died within six months of one another. So I was in mourning for my parents for 18 months. There's a wonderful compendium of laws of mourning called the Pnei Baruch, extremely well done. And I went through it, I didn't go every page, but I read a great deal of it. <coughs> and he asks the following question. Now, if you know people with black hats, you can ask this question, it's a quiz question. One of the things that a man does when he loses a parent is he leads the prayers for 11 months. Um, Suppose in your synagogue, there's more than one person who's mourning for his parents. So you have to divide them up. There are 18 prayers per week, because on Shabbos this isn't done. 18 prayers per week. Let's suppose there are 18 people in the shul who are mourning for their parents, and they have to take it. So you have to divide up one prayer per week. And you are the golden boy. You can decide out of the 18 which one to pick. Which of the 18 prayers per week should you pick to be the one that you do? I asked this for you to your friends with, with, with black hats to see what answer you get. The answer is totally unintuitive. It is the evening prayer Saturday night. That's the one you pick. That's the most important prayer. There's no Kedusha. There's no reading of the Torah. You know, it, it, ma? What? And second most important is all the other evening prayers of the week. And the reason is this. Because on Shabbos, those souls are not being judged. Saturday night, the judgment process starts again. So the souls are sliding from a refuge into the judgment process. If you can do something for the soul when it's transitioning into the judgment process, that's the maximum benefit you can give to the soul. During the rest of the week, the transition from daylight to darkness is an intensification of the judgment process. So if you can do something for the soul under those conditions, you're also doing something that's more, po more powerful and more beneficial for the soul. So I realized what I'm doing here by leading the prayers is because I'm connected to the soul. I'm not reinforcing my psychology and uh, working out my inner feelings of mourning and uh, reconciling myself to the new life and all the kinds of things that sociologists and, and psych psychologists and all the rest of will tell you. Not that they're not true. They're true, but they're not fundamental. What's fundamental is that what we do here depends upon what's going on there. So that's what the Ramchal is saying here. The length of the various prayers is our way of reacting to the fact that God is impressing the world with a new theme, and we're reacting to that theme. And we can do it anonymously. It's sort of like taking a pill when you don't know why you're taking the pill. You don't know the physiology. You don't know the pharmacology. You just know the doctor said take this pill. Right, you know, I'm not used to becoming a doctor. I'm going to be a world-class violinist. Leave me alone with the medicine. You tell me what to take. I'll take it and give it, let me, you know, goodbye. You're doing it. But the doctor said you should do it, so you do it. You can have that kind of dedication to what the Torah tells you to do, but this is what's going on. It's because of this theme that's going, that, 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 that this is going on. 
That's one thing that he says in this passage. Um, And then he makes the remark that if you look at the two blessings, the first blessing after Baruch Hu, before the Shema, d describes a kind of vista on the whole of creation except for man. Man is left out. And in the second paragraph, you have the Jewish people in particular, the kind of relationship that God has with, 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 with the Jewish people. And that Division is a fundamental division because the whole of creation is for mankind. And of mankind, those who are bearing that purpose is the Jewish people. So here I want to tell you something which people know because it's common, but there's a morale on it which is not very well known. Let's suppose someone is on trial for his life. A Jew in a Jewish court is on trial for his life. <coughs> The witnesses are going to give testimony what they observed him do, and if their testimony is accepted, he's going to die. Before the witnesses give their testimony, the court speaks to them and tries to impress upon them the seriousness of what they're doing and to be extremely careful because the consequences are, are very severe. And they say to, to, the, to the witnesses, why was Adam created alone? as an individual, to teach you that each person should say, for my sake the world was created. Just like Adam could say, for my sake the world was created, so each person thereafter should say, for my sake the world was created. And if you, the uh, witnesses, are going to give testimony by which this person shall die, you should know the seriousness of what you're doing. The Maharal asked the obvious question, when Adam was the only person, so then there was only one person. And since there was only one person, then the world could be said to be created for him. But when there are a million, or a billion, or eight billion, how can you sensibly say that the world was created for me? How can you say that? Says the Maharal, something very philosophical, that's why I like it. <laughs> he says, consider the world before Adam was created. All of it. The galaxies, curved space-time, you know, uh, and the whole of the envelope of the, of the, of the Earth with its uh, materials and the vegetation and the animals and the angels, the whole thing. What was its significance? What was its meaning? What was its value? Says the Maharal, zero. Ephes, nothing. With no significance and no value. Had it suddenly winked out of existence, nothing would have been lost. If you're in love with redwood trees and you go out to the forest and hug trees, I hope you'll learn better. Put a person in, one person, and the whole of the creation becomes a, 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 a backdrop for a drama of meaning, value, significance, purpose, because a human being embodies morality and spirituality. And morality and spirituality are the purpose for which the world was created. The world wasn't created for God to show off his great creative power and his great creative sophistication and so on and so on. It was created for the sake of a certain spiritual and, and, and moral purpose. And that's carried only by mankind. So now, says the Mahara, what the mission means to tell you is this. Each person should say to himself, I am the kind of thing which all by myself could give meaning to a whole creation. I could make the difference between zero value and infinite value. Alone, all by myself. Because that's what Autumn did. The creation of Autumn changed uh, a, 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 circum, a circumstance of zero value into a circumstance of infinite value. And they were saying to the, to the, to the witnesses, be careful, because you're giving testimony, 
concerning such a thing which by itself could create, could, could, um, could create value for a whole creation. So the separation between man and, uh, and the rest of the creation is absolutely fundamental. Human exceptionalism. I mean, because we're cleverer than, than, uh, than uh, porpoises and orangutans and, and chimpanzees. That's not it. We are. And the people who think there's a continuity between human capacities and animal capacities are nuts. They're nuts. But aside from that, that's not the point. The point is morality and spirituality, which is utterly absent from the animal kingdom. Um, yeah, I know this stuff was done again about the guy from Harvard who had to resign because he faked his data and all the rest of that. Look it up and you'll see. Um, the next time you think that morality and spirituality have roots in the animal kingdom, tell me how you're going to hold animals responsible for what they do. You're going to punish them? Put them in jail? Kill them when they do bad things? Tell me about it. So um, that's the difference between the, the, the two blessings. The two blessings are utterly, utterly different. When you, the first blessing is about God creating everything else, and the second blessing is the relationship that he makes with human beings, which is the purpose of the whole creation. Okay? Okay, this, this, par this, par this chapter of the Shema could have occupied us for the, for the whole last three months. So that's why I'm, I'm skipping things. Now he comes to prayer. And prayer also is a gigantic, gigantic subject. Um, I'll give you just a, an overview of some of, the, some of the items that he says, and then we'll, then we'll try to go through it in the text. The purpose, those go back three months ago when we started, the purpose of, of creating man is dveikus. Dveikus means attachment to a coach bro being attached. Um, being attached meant, number one, acquiring for oneself qualities that are like divine qualities, which we are capable of doing, semi-divine you might call them, which themselves embody an attachment to divine qualities, attachment to, but not possession of, we're not divine. Also, standing in a personal relationship with the Kodesh Baruch Hu, which ultimately becomes a love relationship, that's the goal of a human being's existence. The highest expression of that goal is prophecy. Prophecy, according to the Ramchal, by definition is that connection with God. It's not receiving uh, messages to give to kings and so forth and so on. It's that attachment to God which delivers a certain understanding which you didn't have before, but it's that, that private connection with, with, uh, with the Kodesh Baruch now, that's a gigantic achievement. Of course, it comes in degrees, but to achieve it on the level of some kind of completeness is something which is given to 0.0001% of the population. The rest of us are struggling during the day, and you have ups and downs even within a particular day, the day. More connection, less connection. That's a normal Jew's spiritual life. But... It's not only that that's our goal, that that realizes our potential and our value. It's a relationship that the Kodesh Baruch wants with us. One, uh, one uh, rabbi put it this way, you may have heard the Mesil Sashorim, the path of the just, the book of the Rebbe. So that's the entry exam into training for the Vekas, the entry exam. To have done all of that is your preparation for achieving the Vekas. Okay, so I look at that and I think, without a miracle, hopeless, <laughs> hopeless. It's because Baruch Hu says, but I don't want to be to totally disconnected from you. So I'm offering you free dvekas three times a day. The door to the throne room is open. Come in. Let's share. The difference between this free gift on the one hand and earning it on the other hand is that when you earn it, you can make it permanent. And as the Ramam writes in the, in the Moran Vuchim, the idea is to have this dvekus accompany you no matter what you're doing. You have to develop a kind of split consciousness 
where, yes, you are engaged in negotiations, or like I'm engaged in exercise to strengthen my tendons, or other things that you do, but simultaneously, you're conscious of the fact that you're walking through life hand in hand with the Creator. I can tell you, it's, it's, if you, if you have, are privileged to experience this, uh, it makes an impression on you. I, I reported, and other people who were close to my Rebbe, that when we interacted with the Rebbe, we, we felt that he, he, with his two eyes, one eye was focused on us, the other eye was focused up. And he was, he was there for us. Exquisitely sensitive, but the other eye was focused up. And how to bring Kodesh Baruch Hu's presence into the world through this interaction. That's the way he was, that's the way he functioned. That's the idea, that's what the, the Maimonides describes, Abraham. And then he says, but me, I can't teach you that. I'm just trying to keep my, keep my, my mind like God when I pray and when I, when I, when I learn. You know, he, he was very humble in that respect. Um, but that, that's the idea, because Rogan says, I want you to have free Vegas, a free connection with me. So that means the challenge is, since that's what's being offered in prayer, the challenge is to be conscious of it. This, I think, goes hand in hand with one of the brisker insights, which is that we talk about having kavana in prayer. That is to say, being conscious of what we're saying, what we're meaning, what's going on. So they distinguish between two levels. One level is to be conscious of the fact that you're interacting with the Creator. That's one level. And the other is the meanings of the words and the fact that they are quotations from, from verses from, from the prophets and uh, the various laws that might be involved and all the rest. The first being conscious of the fact that you're interacting with the Creator is the definition of prayer. If you lose that, you're not praying. You're not praying. You're in the forest, you're in the zoo, you're not praying. You're mumbling and you're not, you're not accomplishing anything. The second is to improve the quality of what you're doing. Yes, it's an adverb. It's not the verb, it's the adverb. So this goes hand in hand. I don't remember that they quote the Ramchal as terms of the inner reality of it, they did it on, on a halakhic basis, according to Rambam. But this is the opportunity that prayer, that prayer uh, offers. And this is one of the reasons, by the way, when we say prayer, we only mean the Shemona Esrei, the silent prayer. The word prayer in technical uh, Hebrew law does not apply saying the Shema, or the blessings to the beginning, or the Psalms that you recite at the beginning, or Aleinu, that's not prayer. That's associated materials and meditations. And that's why, at least in Shachas, there's so much preparation for it. <coughs> because you want those moments, that five minutes or seven minutes or ten minutes that you spend saying the, the silent prayer, to be as conscious and focused as possible and to be as deeply experienced as possible. Because that's the moment where Kodesh Baruch Hu says, I'm here for you. I'm here to interact with you. I'm here to, to relate to you. So that's one of the things that, that, that prayer does. The second thing that prayer does is this. We spoke about this in the first part. Kodesh Baruch is running the world. Uh, we have all sorts of projects. We make all sorts of decisions. Um, we have control over our decisions. After that, everything that happens after that is a divine response to our decisions. We don't control the physical world at all. Ramchal talks about this in the, Ram, in the Das Funas at the beginning. The, what's called nature is, is just a, a divine product, moment by moment. As we just said, he's renewing the creation continuously. So, um, when you're involved in the world, we spoke about this, what happened after we were exiled from the Garden of Eden. When you're involved in the world, it's hard to keep that in mind. You study the world, you, uh, create, you learn a, a skill or an art form or whatever it is, and that usually requires exquisite management of natural resources. And you uh, pay careful attention and you try to produce results in various ways. All the time, the physical reality is foremost in your consciousness. And it takes on a reality of its own 
The fact that it's a divine product recedes into the background, something which you're not, not conscious of. Um, and then there's a gigantic temptation when there's a success to take credit for it. I did study the market for six years before I started investing. And I did study the figures, you know, day and night. And the first three years, I made $10 million. Okay, I worked very hard. I did. And that's why I was successful, because I learned it. I learned it, I mastered it, and I worked very hard. Now, from my point of view, that's spiritual poison. That's why you succeeded, because you worked very hard and you controlled it, you made it happen. There isn't anything like that. You don't make anything happen. But how do you maintain that consciousness when the day's activities force you to be immersed in the physical world? One of the keys to that is prayer. Because the Shemona Esrei, the silent prayer, the lion's portion of it is petitions to God. It's asking God for things. And the categories mentioned there, I think, exhaust the, all the normal categories of human endeavor. And uh, you have something that you're involved in which isn't mentioned in any of those categories. So the last of those blessings, Shomei Atfila, covers any other category which isn't specifically mentioned because Shomei Atfila is where you ask God to hear you and answer your petitions. So whatever it is that you are in need of, you're petitioning him and you're asking him, please answer my, my petition. If you express that petition sincerely, that prepares you so that when, you, when it comes, you receive it as a gift. So that you don't take it as something that you produced for yourself. So the fact that we have prayer in the morning is a tremendous tool for maintaining this consciousness. It's the please which then leads to the thank you. And the thank you is where you maintain your consciousness that you're not producing it for yourself. That's the second function that, that prayer has. I'll say one more general thing, and then I'll, I'll, I'll work on the text tomorrow. We know that there's a relationship between prayer and, and sacrifices. Now, I have to be very careful here. The Gemara is very clear. It says that the prayers were made to correspond with the sacrifices. Not to replace the sacrifices. Can't tell you how many external ignoramuses who call themselves critics of religion say, well, now we have the prayers, we don't need the sacrifices anymore, and so forth and so on. It's absolute baloney. To correspond. After all, the prayers were instituted at the beginning of the Second Temple. Prayer and sacrifices went hand in hand for 400 years, 420 years. So if they were designed to replace the missing sacrifices, it's a very funny thing to do it when the sacrifices are being reinstituted. No, they're designed to correspond with the sacrifices. Okay, now, where does that come from? Who invented that idea? How did the rabbis dream that up? Well, listen, boys and girls, they didn't dream it up. There are explicit verses that say so. Explicit. First of all, there's one that's very popular because it's a popular song. I will bring them to uh, my holy mountain and I will cause them to rejoice in the house of my prayer. Which house is that? God's house of prayer. Well, then the next phrase is, their sacrifices offered on the altar will be pleasing to me. Oh, sacrifices on the altar. I guess this is the temple, hey? But he just called it the house of prayer. And in case you didn't get the point, it says, because my house will be called the house of prayer for all peoples. So it's house of prayer, house of prayer, and in the middle there are sacrifices. Hello, that's Isaiah talking. Somehow, the place where you offer sacrifices has a title called House of Prayer. But that's the minor player in the game. 
If you go back to King Solomon, when he created the temple, he built it. And you look at his dedication of the temple, like three, three chapters in the beginning of the book of Kings. A long soliloquy, a long description and prayer to God that the, that the, that the temple should be successful. The only activity that he mentions with respect to the temple is prayer. The only activity is prayer. Just prayer. Only prayer. From his dedication, you would never know there were any sacrifices there at all. That's gigantic. Somehow, the essence is prayer. Sacrifices are somehow in God, involved in prayer, engaged in prayer. The, the identity of the two of them is somehow, somehow uh, uh, intertwined with one another. Now, I have a whole chapter in my book on, called The Informed Soul from Art School, which, which I talk about. So I'm not going to go through the whole chapter with you. But the relationship between prayer and sacrifices is absolutely inherent. And the rabbis, when they created the formal rules of how to pray, were simply codifying that idea which, was, which preceded them for, by hundreds of years. Hundreds of years before that idea was already planted. They just codified it in a certain way for certain purposes. And the details are in the chapter in my book. Yeah. Okay, we're together? All right. I'm sorry? I think you answered my question. Was, what was the form of prayer before? That? Oh, so that's, that's, so it's very interesting. The, the, before the, the institution of the formal uh, rules of prayer, which began at the beginning of the Second Temple, people prayed spontaneously. Moses prays in the, in the, several times in, in, the, in the Chumash. Isaac prays for the sake of having a child with, with Rivka. I mean, prayer is, is part of the Jewish tradition all the way through. But it was left to people to pray on their own. Um, the beginning of the Second Temple period is when prophecy stopped. And the loss of prophecy was a major shift in Jewish practice and consciousness. And it had a number of different, we spoke about the fact that when, when uh, that there was the time when, I, when they asked to remove the spirit of idol worship, and that's, that's why prayer stopped, because the two of them are alternatives to one another. That is a time when prayer was instituted, and that's the time when the Mishnah was started. There's something in the Mishnah called the Mishnah Rishonah, the first Mishnah, the idea of codifying the uh, oral tradition started at, at that time. It carried on for centuries, but it started at that time. So there was a time when certain foundations were being laid. After all, the men of the Great Assembly included the last prophets. So this was like the last shot to get a prophetic input. <clears throat> and they laid certain foundations. They, they also determined which books that they had really had the holiness that we incorporated into the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, which not. So they canonized the written, the written tradition. They set the foundations of prayer, and they began the process of organizing the, uh, the, the oral tradition. That, those are like absolute foundations on which the people then continue to, continue to function. Um, and uh, the one explanation for prayer was that the people people who interacted with prophets were on a spiritual level that was incomparable. Uh, I heard the name of the Gura, though people, other, there are various versions, the name of the Gura, that he could think himself back and experience what it was like to live as a Jew up to the time when there were prophets. But when they spoke with prophets, at that point he, his, he, could, not, he could not picture what their, their, their Yiddishkeit meant. We mentioned what the Ramban says, that during that period of time no one went to a doctor. You had a physical problem, you went to the prophet, he told you what your spiritual problem was, you fixed that, and the physical problem went away. They were in contact with divine influence, explicit, personalized divine influence, <clears throat> regularly. So we wouldn't have anything like that. So prayer was, was, was free at that time. And then it had to be institutionalized, yeah. So is it safe to, uh, to say that what happened we discussed that um, prophecy is a way to connect to Hashem. 
And so beforehand, we were able to pray on our own because we had that sort of ability to connect. And when the prophets, the assembly, basically wanted us to be able to connect to Hashem in the future in generations, they put the form of tefillah in a way where we can actually connect to Hashem. Okay, let's think about that. That's a, you, you built a nice uh, binion there, built a nice, a nice picture. Prophecy was, is the supreme connection to Hashem. They spoke with prophets. That enabled them to be able to spontaneously connect with Hashem. Now we're not going to speak with prophets anymore. So the last prophets gave over, uh, participated in creating a formula whereby that ability to enable connection with Hashem would be made permanent. So that very nice binion, you know, that's, that's the way you build an idea. It's a very nice idea. I think just as long as you put it the way I put it, I changed your formulation just a little bit. Now, the prophets are supremely connected. And interaction with prophets could make it possible for others who are not prophets to be more connected than otherwise. They're not going to imitate or, or duplicate the prophet. We okay, didn't mean it, but I'm just formulating explicitly that way. Um, and then that the prophets should be involved in a, in a constellation that should enable that kind of connection is a very nice thought. A very nice thought. I, I put, put, together, put the thing together very nicely. It even could very well be true. <laughs> you know, to verify the truth, you have to find it someplace. But it, it's a very nice thought. It makes a lot of sense. Um, and that's what I say, that it, it's freed vacus. It's, it's a gigantic, gigantic gift. It's a gigantic opportunity. And we have to, you know, the, the, the Kuzari says that prayer is food for the soul. Now, I'm putting it my turn, but it's his idea. When you finish eating breakfast, you know where you're eating lunch, don't you? It's planned out. And dinner also. It's planned out. Because eating is very important. It's very important. You know, you need meals to eat during the day. Says the Kuzari, when you finish, when you finish the morning prayer, your thought should be, yeah, and when's the afternoon prayer? I'm not going to pray it now, but Okay, but you know, okay. <laughs> in the middle, of it, I have to do when the next prayer. You know, it's got to be on schedule. When, where is it going to be? Because it's food for the soul. It's food for the soul. The ultimate food for the soul is this connection with the Kodesh Baruch Hu, and that's what the prayer gives you in spades. That's why it's so precious. Yeah. Shabbos, perhaps also. No? I'm sorry. Say again. Shabbos. I'm not getting you. Shabbos. Shabbos is the realization of the the bekus, no? Like, uh, realization of the of the bekut. That. It makes it much more possible. It, but that's not, we were talking about prayer. There are lots of things that have enabled Vekut. Not just that. Not just that. Hospitality. I mean, there are a lot of things that do it in different ways. I don't know how, why it's relevant to the discussion of prayer. Shabbos. It's just another thing that, that, is a, that is a relevant instrument. Yeah, it certainly is. But many things are. Many things are. Yeah. Okay, so we'll pick this up tomorrow, musician.